And today I'm presenting a study that was carried out um, from Chris McGlinchey and Leon Duffner at MoMA. The focus of today's presentation is a silver gelatin print that was face laminated with a strongly tinted orange film that MoMA conservation scientist Chris McGlinchey identified as cellophane during the Thomas Walter Collection Project in 2010. In the late 1930s, cellophane, a type of regenerated cellulose, was at the height of its popularity. And the part motivation for using such a material was a likely effort to emulate the special effects of the day related to cinema, that of hand-colored motion picture films. With further consideration of Tabard's photographic experimentation and his work in graphic departments of emerging journals, we can explore the use of this early polymeric material. The other one. Okay. Born July 12, 1897 in Lyon, France, Maurice Tabard was raised by his father and initially worked in the family silk business. This is worth noting because the topic of this presentation, cellophane in fiber form, was the silk substitute material developed at the same time. Called viscous rayon silk, it has the appearance and hand of a natural silk and was dramatically cheaper. It was but one of many uses of regenerated cellulose. In 1914, Tabard moved with his father to New Jersey and enrolled in classes at the Institute of Photography in New York with Emile Brunel. After his father's death in 1922, he made his living with a variety of different small jobs until the Baccarat Studios hired him as a photographer, essentially launching his career as a photographer. Shortly after his arrival in Paris, he was swept up into the surrealist movement and the avant-garde, befriended Marais and René Magritte, but was also introduced to a number of important magazine editors and art directors of the time. Soon he himself became director of the photography uh, department of De Berny and Pignon. From 1929 throughout 1930s, Tabard published in some of the most important magazines in Paris, Jardin de Mode, Marie Claire, Art and Medicine, but also in avant-garde magazines such as Jazz, Before and Vu. His friendship with Marais broke when Tabard published detailed technical description of solarization in some of these important magazines. Although Maurice Tabard started out as conventional portrait photographer in the United States, he made his name internationally as a musician of solarization and other darkroom ma manipulations. Mm -hmm. These 10 photographs were acquired by MoMA between 1982 and 1992. These images begin to show his interest in reflection, shadows, and the filtering of light mixed with multiple exposures. The full depth of his artistic wo work, however, is best represented in this group, the corner store of the French Surrealist in the Thomas Walter collection. All Mama Tabard photographs are from the first 10 years from his first time in Paris, 1928 to 1938. They are shown from left to right, top to bottom. So you'll have a collage, first on top, solarization and preferential hand development, distortion, multiple ex three multiple exposures, a self-portrait, um, solarization and reversal print, and the subject there uh, of this presentation. The 1936 so-called test for the film cult voodoo is a gelatin silver print with tinted cellophane laminate and mounted on secondary support. Hands and masked faces are often subject matter in Tabard photographs. The extended fingers here are false addition, but may allude to a form of Marfan's syndrome, first diagnosed by the Parisian Anthony Bernard Jean Marfan, who received an honorary <coughs> fellowship um, from the Royal Society of Medicine in 1934. The subject predates Tabard's travels in Africa in the 1940s, but suggests an early interest in African culture and symbolism. The Pompidou has a similar print that is more tightly framed and was not part of this study. The photograph 
was laminated with a sheet of tinted cellophane film, trimmed and mounted intentionally off-center to a secondary mount with dry mount tissue. The Addis mat is signed to bar 36 at the lower right-hand corner. Overall, the, wor the work is in very good condition, and considering the current vibrancy of the cellophane colorant, we can only assume at this time that there has been little shifting or loss of the coloring of the dye in the last 80 years. The main preservation concerns of this work are preservation of the worn edges and monitoring of the work. The detail at right shows the cut edge. Another tabard print of cinema film from the Thomas Walter collection also shows this predilection for off-center mounting, which was a distinctly modernist aesthetic of the time. Shown here in natural specular and partly raking illumination, you can see the extremely glossy surface. Tabard also used matte surface papers. There is a fair amount of retouching on top of the extremely glossy cellophane surface. Tabar often retouched both glossy and matte prints extensively. And although we cannot say for sure if this particular retouching is by Tabar or is a later restoration, it is in keeping with its artist's practice. There is no evidence of adhesive at the interface or localized clamping or handwork on the surface of the cellophane. It is likely that a commercial or small-scale industrial process was used. A dry month press is one of possibility. There is no visual or scientific evidence of a separate adhesive at the interface, but a thin film of cellophane is weakly attached. This suggests the type of cellophane used was bonded with a coating specifically formulated to have heat set properties. This is not particularly surprising because during this time, cellophane was used in packaging that was heat set sealed. The weak bond might not endure so much strain, but it's useful to know that the cellular structure of the cellophane, photographic paper, and the mount all likely have a similar strain response to, to fluctuation in humidity, so the development of strain-induced stresses may be small. Nevertheless, the stratified composition is one further argument to minimize the range of climate fluctuation this print might be exposed to. Examination of the film by FTIR found it most closely matched cellophane. Cellophane, or regenerated cellulose, having the same molecular structure of the native product, has approximately the same spectra. The main difference is in the intensity of the bands, primarily due to variation in hydrogen bonding and the degree of crystallinity. Cellophane is essentially more amorphous, which accounts for its transparency in invisible light. The OH stretch at around 3400 for the cellophane reference material shows some specific modes of the OH stretch characteristic of pure cellophane. The difference between it and the Tarbert sample may indicate the latter is not pure cellophane. And we already know this because the film is colorized It might contain some additional materials that are in too low A concentration to detect or don't show any characteristic peaks separate from cellophane in the higher spectrum. <coughs> we tried to take a sample from the trimmed edge that includes the photographic paper and the orange film, but in each instance, the two materials separated, underscoring our interest in limiting the climate fluctuation this print is exposed to. From this cross-section image, we learn a few things. The film is very thin, about 13 microns, or one half of a thousand of an inch. As far as the industry standards go using the terminology of the 30s, a half, a half mil film is thin compared to other cellophane films using packaging. It is likely that this film was intended specifically to be a laminating film and be bonded to a support. It also tinted throughout the film, indicating that the material was tinted in the vat during polymer processing. It is difficult to tell if there, if there are additional layers of this at the cellophane embedded media interface. If there is anything, it's very thin. 
Here are the stages the raw material undergoes to become cellophane. The raw fibrous and semi-crystalline material is digested by sodium hydroxide solution. As the reaction proceeds, there is a reduction in molecular weight related to chain cesium of the main chain of the polymer. The reaction can go too far because the product will be useless as solid. The xanthate salt in the lower right corner is the penultimate stage where dyes will be added to produce a tinted throughout the dyed material. Forcing this material through a slot dye makes a viscous gel that is stretched through an acid bath. As the xanthate is lost to acidification, the cellulose is regenerated but but at a lower molecular weight. This reaction don't show it, but it's important to know that crystalline structure is greatly reduced, resulting in a transparent product. This reference cited below contain, contains some useful information on the topic of cellophane. First, it mentions as it comes off the casting machine, it has relatively little commercial value because it cannot be heat sealed and it has a very thin rate of moisture permeability. The, auth the author gives a recipe for a typical coating applied to cellophane that improves both the heat sellability as well as the moisture barrier properties. A 12% solid, the cast film would be inherently thin and likely even thinner depending upon manufacturing process used to apply it. Let's explore a little bit more about Tabar and what was going on around him in the 1930s. This cover of Wu magazine from March 1936 is a, is a photogram by Tabar. Orange washes of color are sometimes used to convey a nocturnal impression, but it can also be used to illustrate fire. This is a still from a film in Mama's collection. Early cinema used color in two ways. Details could be painstakingly colorized with transparent dyes in each frame, or a sequence of frames were tinted overall with a one color to set the mood. This image shows an example of colorized film, but judging the real tracks may have been initially washed with a tint. In today's terms, we would say cellophane went viral in, by the late 1920s. The material was first introduced by France, in France by La Cellophane Company, and then licensed to DuPont in US and Kale in UK to expand the market. It was the first material that was lightweight, transparent, flexible, and heat sealable with good barrier properties. Traits highly practical for packaging. Three important and early cellophane applications were all related to packaging, perfume, candy, and cigarettes. In fact, according to Cowley, the largest market for cellophane in the 20s was packaging for cigarettes. Judging from the folds um, in this package and its size, our model is likely to have just opened a, packet, a, pack, a pack of cigarettes and is taking in the aroma of fresh tobacco. Note how Fitz draws more attention to her nose than to the fact she can see through it, a feature probably obvious to the viewer. In Judith Brown's book, Glamour in Six Dimensions, the author cites a quote uh, from Paul Frankel's 1930s book, Form and Reform, where base materials are transmuted into marvels of new beauty. Brown continued, given the low cost of the material, it persists to be one of the bright spots during the global depression. Tabard knew Max Ernst, and on the left you see a collage of his drawing which contains cellophane elements. On your right, scotch tape, will be, um, scotch tape with a cellophane carrier was included in MoMA's 2004 exhibition, Humble Masterpiece. And as a conservator, masterpiece is not exactly the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a cellotape. In the performing arts, a cellophane played a prominent role in the premiere of the opera Fort Saints in three acts at the Wordsworth in February 1934. This coincides with the first retrospective of Pablo Picasso in the United States. Working on the opera while in Paris, Virgil Thompson conceived the opera, Gertrude Stein produced the libretto, and Florence Tetheimer 
designed the set and costumes. The timer used 1,500 square feet of blue transparent cellophane to filter the light and produce a blue sky that was noted by many. One cri critic referred to it as a butty cellophane. One last example, Picabia is another artist uh, known to Tabar working in Paris as part of the Dada movement. Um, clearly, tinted cellophane was abundant and available in a spectrum of colors. So to summarize, it is impossible to point to a single source that gave Tabar the idea to laminate a, phot um, a photographic print with orange tinted cellophane. The material was so ubiquitous, it's perfectly logical choice for someone like Tabar who, who was interested in experimenting and pushing the boundaries of photography. So it was an experiment probably, and we don't have any evidence of him using this method again. And to conclude, the Google and Gram Viewer is a word frequency counter um, for all the books that have been scanned for a given publication year. Here we show the range 1915 2008 and plot the number of times cellophane and petrochemical occur. While cellophane peaked between 1940, after Tabar used it, and 1960, it is currently more prevalent in word usage than petrochemical, which had its own peak in the early 1980s. Cellophane and other modified cellulose biopolymers are a very active area or of research and will remain important materials into the 21st century and beyond. In fact, the research that we carried out um, for the RC project that you will hear about tomorrow morning found the same type of studies being carried out on cellophane that were being carried out on poly polyethylene, the petrochemical polymer used in RC papers. So it's not far-fetched to predict that one day biopolymers like cellophane will be the new RC papers. Thank you.